So here's the situation. Ultra-large container vessels, the backbone of global trade, are on a collision course with a crisis that could send shockwaves through every American household. And when it comes to dissecting the intricacies of this looming threat, Tucker Carlson is stepping into the fray with insights that will have you on the edge of your seat and what he's about to say could change the way we see the vital lifelines of international trade. This is one story you can't afford to ignore. Recently, there's been a concerning decline in the presence of gigantic container vessels at U.S. ports. These ULCVs are the heavyweights of the shipping industry, hauling massive amounts of cargo in a single trip. This isn't happening by chance. This unsettling trend could spell the beginning of the United States' downfall. In the Red Sea, a vital trade route for these colossal ships, a group known as the Houthis, is causing upheaval, compelling shipping companies to reconsider their routes. Now, here's the kicker. The Red Sea serves as a critical passageway for ships journeying between Asia and Europe. Any disturbance in this key route can set off a chain reaction, sending shockwaves throughout the entire shipping industry. Now, circling back to the Houthi group, their mere presence has transformed the Red Sea into a chaotic hub, disrupting the seamless flow of goods and exposing a significant crack in the shipping industry's system. So, who exactly are these Houthis, and what's the reason behind their disruptive behavior in the Red Sea? The Houthis constitute a faction of armed rebels driven by fervent political and religious convictions, particularly in support of Yemen's Shia Muslim minority, the Zaydis. They identify themselves as part of the axis of resistance, led by Iran and harbor strong aversions towards Israel, the US, and the broader Western world. They've gained notoriety for targeting ships they believe are linked to Israel, even when some of the vessels attacked have no affiliations with Israel whatsoever. In a recent incident last year, a tanker with British connections became a target, with the Houthis citing American-British aggression as their justification. It's akin to a high-stakes game of cat and mouse on the open seas, with US-led naval forces working tirelessly to thwart these attacks whenever possible. The entire scenario has major shipping companies declaring, you know what, we're steering clear of the Red Sea for now. Instead, they've chosen the scenic route around Southern Africa, which may be lengthier, but is deemed safer than dealing with the ongoing drama in the Red Sea. It's not merely about these ships avoiding conflict zones, it's about the after-effects that ensue. This is a significant development because nearly 15% of global seaborne trade typically traverses this route. The diversion of such a substantial percentage can only hint at the considerable impact on the countries along that route. Once more, as ships redirect away from the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, Alternative routes are becoming increasingly congested, resulting in bottlenecks and delays. Ports along these alternative routes are grappling with heightened pressure to manage the surge in ship traffic, exacerbating the strain on already stretched resources. And don't overlook the economic impact. Shipping delays can cause widespread consequences, affecting industries that depend on timely deliveries and raising costs for businesses and consumers alike. It's like a chain reaction, one hiccup triggers another, setting off a ripple effect across the global economy. Yet, the most notable repercussion of the Houthi conflict is its illumination of the interplay between geopolitics and global trade. It serves as a stark reminder that events in one corner of the world can wield profound implications for economies situated thousands of miles away. The Houthi conflict stands as a wake-up call for the shipping industry underscoring the imperative for robust risk management strategies and contingency plans to navigate through these turbulent waters. Although the Houthi conflict might appear distant, its far-reaching effects are nothing short of alarming, molding the destiny of global shipping and underscoring the vulnerability of our interconnected world. The exodus of these colossal ships from the ports of a specific country is leaving a noticeable void, creating an unsettling emptiness. Can you guess which country is bearing the brunt? Now, why is this a cause for concern? It's not merely about the ships. It's about the crucial cargo they carry, the goods and products essential to our daily lives. When these ships circumvent US ports, it has the potential to disrupt the availability of specific products, casting a ripple effect that can extend to impact the broader economy. As we explore these new developments, we're left with some big questions. How can we get these ships to come back to our shores? And how do we make sure our ports stay a crucial part of the global shipping network? To figure out why these huge container vessels are avoiding US ports, 
let's take a closer look at their journeys. Fortunately, we've got some handy technology to help us with that. It's called marine traffic, like Google Maps for ships. With marine traffic, we can see exactly where these massive vessels are heading, and where they're coming from. And what we discover is quite eye-opening. Most of these ships set sail from places like East Asia, where big manufacturing hubs create products for markets all around the world. Now, here's the intriguing twist. Rather than following the usual path through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal to reach Europe and the United States, many of these ultra-large container vessels, ULCVs, are taking alternative routes. They're steering clear of potential conflict areas, like the Red Sea, and opting for safer paths that bypass US ports entirely. So, where are these ships headed instead? Well, we spot them making layovers in places like Europe and Africa, where ports are buzzing with activity. While it's positive news for those regions, it's leaving US ports a bit on the sidelines. Yet, it's not just about their destinations, it's also about the savvy way they're getting there. We observe these ships strategically navigating to dodge obstacles like adverse weather and rough seas, ensuring their journey remains as smooth as possible. Stepping back to see the bigger picture, it's evident that the shipping industry is in constant motion, adjusting to shifts and discovering new routes to stay competitive. However, when we delve into the intricate patterns of global maritime traffic, a darker narrative emerges. There are unsettling revelations about why these ultra-large container vessels, ULCVs, are avoiding US ports. And the implications for the future of shipping are disconcerting. To grasp the strained relationship between US ports and the absence of these ships, let's rewind and understand the evolution of these container ships. Picture the 1950s, a time of excitement as container shipping takes its initial steps. In those days, ships were much smaller, capable of carrying only a fraction of the colossal loads handled by today's giants. These early ships, dubbed Panamax vessels, took their name from the Panama Canal, which set the size limit for ships navigating its locks. However, as global trade surged and the demand for larger vessels increased, the shipping industry had to think beyond the norm, or more accurately, beyond the canal. Enter the post-Panamax era in the late 1980s, when ships started surpassing the limitations of the Panama Canal. These vessels, larger and capable of carrying more containers, ushered in a new era of maritime transportation. Yet, with this increased size came significant challenges. Ports had to revamp their infrastructure to accommodate these colossal ships. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and we witnessed the emergence of very large container ships, VLCs, exemplified by Maersk's E-Class and Triple E-Class vessels. These giants redefined the concept of size, stretching over 400 meters and dominating the seas with their immense presence. They weren't just ships, they were floating cities capable of transporting thousands of containers across oceans. However, their sheer size presented logistical challenges, particularly when it came to docking at ports. Ports had to invest in taller cranes, deeper berths, and expanded facilities to efficiently handle these mega ships. And let's not overlook the Panama Canal. It underwent a massive expansion to accommodate these new giants, ushering in the era of Neo-Panamax ships, designed specifically for the expanded canal. Just when we thought ships couldn't grow any larger, we entered the ultra-large container vessels, ULCVs, and Megabox 24s. These sea monsters boast capacities exceeding 20,000 TEUs and measure over 400 meters in length. They resemble floating skyscrapers, towering over everything in their path. Their colossal size has truly transformed the shipping industry, enabling companies to move more goods in fewer journeys. However, their presence in US ports has been limited, primarily due to infrastructure limitations. Ports must invest in dredging, elevating bridges, and deploying specialized cranes to accommodate these giants, a substantial financial commitment. Moreover, it's crucial to recognize that it's not just about size. Efficiency plays a pivotal role. These modern container ships come equipped with cutting-edge technology, enabling them to navigate the seas with enhanced safety and efficiency. Advanced navigation systems, automated cargo handling, and energy-efficient engines empower these ships to cover vast distances while minimizing their environmental footprint. While these advancements undeniably enhance the efficiency of maritime transportation, they also prompt concerns about the sustainability of such massive vessels. Critics argue that the environmental toll of operating these megaships 
from their substantial carbon footprint to the potential for oil spills, might outweigh their advantages. Consequently, there's mounting pressure on the shipping industry to explore greener alternatives, such as adopting cleaner fuels and investing in renewable energy technologies. Moreover, the evolution of container ships transcends size and efficiency. It encompasses the shifting dynamics of global trade. As these ships grow larger and more efficient, they empower companies to transport goods worldwide at reduced costs, leading to a surge in global trade volumes. This interconnectedness of economies presents both advantages and drawbacks, spanning increased economic growth and job opportunities to concerns about job displacement and income inequality. From their modest beginnings as Panamax vessels to the towering giants of today, these ships have transformed global trade and commerce in ways we never thought possible. However, their immense size and capacity bring forth fresh challenges for ports and infrastructure, demanding ongoing investment and adaptation to keep pace with the ever-evolving demands of the shipping industry. As we navigate into the future, it's crucial to strike a balance between the benefits of larger ships and the imperative for sustainable and resilient infrastructure, ensuring the seamless flow of goods and upholding the vitality of global trade. Yet. What raises concerns is how a nation like the United States seems to have missed the memo on these advancements. Was it truly an oversight, or is there a possibility of foul play at play? It's evident that US ports aren't fully equipped to handle the surge of these colossal container ships. While there have been some improvements over the years, such as dredging harbors to deepen shipping channels and expanding terminal facilities to accommodate larger vessels, there's still a significant gap. A major hurdle confronting U.S. ports is outdated infrastructure. Numerous ports were constructed decades ago and lack the capabilities to manage the size and volume of present-day ships. This results in prolonged waiting periods for ships to dock, slower turnaround times for cargo, and escalated costs for shipping companies. Adding to the challenges is the problem of congestion. As an increasing number of ships compete for limited space at U.S. ports, congestion has emerged as a tangible issue. This not only hampers operations but also heightens the likelihood of accidents and delays, intensifying the existing challenges faced by our ports. However, the most formidable challenge of all revolves around funding. The construction and upkeep of port infrastructure come with a hefty price tag. We're talking about billions of dollars. While there have been strides in obtaining funding for port projects, it still falls short of meeting the escalating demands of the shipping industry. Now, how do we tackle these challenges head on? To begin with, the U.S. must prioritize investing in port infrastructure. This entails securing additional funding for dredging, expanding terminals, and upgrading equipment to handle larger ships more efficiently. Yet, it's not solely about pouring money into the issue. The government also needs to streamline regulations and processes. Simplifying bureaucratic hurdles and fostering collaboration with government agencies, shipping companies, and other stakeholders are crucial steps to facilitate necessary improvements that benefit everyone involved. In essence, the challenges confronting U.S. ports are intricate and varied, yet they are not insurmountable. With strategic investments, effective policies, and collaborative partnerships, the U.S. can ensure that its ports remain pivotal centers of economic activity fostering the nation's growth and prosperity for years to come. Moreover, the U.S. possesses some of the world's most potent resources to tackle this issue, both in terms of material and human resources. Just before we delve into one of the most apparent human resources that the U.S. can leverage in this situation, here's a hint at a solution the government can explore. Technology. This encompasses automation, artificial intelligence, and real-time data analytics. By harnessing the power of technology, ports can streamline processes, reduce wait times, and enhance overall efficiency. For instance, automated cranes can unload containers from ships faster and more accurately than humans, saving time and labor costs. Similarly, smart systems using AI can organize how containers are stacked and routed, ensuring trucks and trains are loaded and unloaded efficiently. To make things work smoothly, ports, shipping companies, trucking firms, and government agencies all need to team up. This means breaking down barriers and figuratively building bridges to create a seamless flow of goods from ships to shores and markets. 
Another key part of making ports more efficient is investing in training and development for the workforce. As technology advances, the skills of the people working at our ports need to keep up. And, of course, we can't overlook sustainability. Ports contribute significantly to air and water pollution, but by making smart investments in clean energy and environmental protection measures, we can reduce their impact on the planet. Whether it's electrifying port equipment or initiating green infrastructure projects, there are numerous ways to make our ports more sustainable and eco-friendly. Now, what can we do about it? Well, buckle up, because it's more than just shipping news, it's a guide to tackling real-world challenges. First off, Tucker's big advice, be ready for global impacts. Like, imagine knowing that international events can hit your local economy. Wouldn't you want to prep for that? It's all about being proactive. And here's a nugget of wisdom, strategic navigation. Tucker compares it to those massive ships avoiding conflict zones. In life, we got to plan ahead to sail smoothly through rough times. Now, understanding geopolitical dynamics may sound fancy, but Tucker breaks it down. The Houthi conflict teaches us that what happens on one side of the globe can ruffle feathers elsewhere. Stay in the know to dodge surprises. Tucker's all about being ready for the unexpected. He says, implement robust risk management. Unforeseen events can shake things up and having a solid plan is like having your own ship in stormy seas. Now infrastructure is a big deal. Tucker emphasizes the need to invest. It's like upgrading ports to handle those gigantic ships efficiently. A bit like giving your local harbor a makeover. But wait, there's more. Tucker dives into the world of technology. He suggests using automation, AI, and real-time data analytics to make things smoother. Imagine ships unloading faster with automated cranes, efficiency at its finest. And what's the secret to all of this? Collaboration. According to Tucker, breaking down barriers and teaming up, that's the way to go. It's like having everyone on deck working together. Workforce training is on Tucker's list too. As tech advances, so should the skills of those working in ports. It's like leveling up in a video game, but for real-life careers. Now let's talk about sustainability. Tucker's got an eye on the environment. Ports can be polluters, but investing in clean energy and eco-friendly projects can make a difference. It's like making your port a green zone. Funding is another challenge, and Tucker's advice is clear. Recognize the cost and secure the bucks. It's like saying, invest wisely to keep the ship sailing. Regulations and processes need to be streamlined, says Tucker. Make things smoother and you'll avoid a bureaucratic storm. It's about simplifying and working together. Now, technology is key. Well, many people in Ireland are absolutely sick of this. It's happening by design. That country has been completely transformed by immigration. It's not the Ireland you remember at all. The new hate speech laws are coming to Ireland. No complaining about it. And of course, it's not just Ireland, it's across the West. Europe finds itself in the throes of chaos, grappling with multifaceted challenges. Several days ago, a man in his 50s, for reasons that are still not clear, five people outside a school in Dublin, Ireland, including three children. And then almost immediately after, parts of that city erupted into rioting. What exactly is going on here? Gonzalo published two years ago a list, I think it was 12 or 13 individuals that had disappeared. They were tortured and then dead. And Gonzalo said, if I'm off the air for more than 24 hours, add me on the list. Hungary, despite its alliance with the US, faces treatment seemingly harsher than that meted out to Russia. American citizens who live and work in Hungary have to pay Hungarian taxes to your government, but also full federal taxes to the United States. But, but, but the attitude as such, we are a member of NATO, we are allied to the United States, and we are worse treated than the Russians, you know. What, what's that about? A wave of political intolerance sweeps across the West, where questioning government policies risks felony charges. And going forward, anyone who complains about that or questions government policy will be guilty of a felony. The new hate speech laws are coming to Ireland. No complaining about it. And of course, it's not just Ireland, it's across the West. What does this mean? What is happening here? And what's the right response to it? The alarming imprisonment of American citizen Gonzalo Lira for speaking truth sends shockwaves. 
Biden administration spent U.S. tax dollars to campaign against you in your last election. They didn't succeed. You won in a, in a fair election. Um, big money. Big money. I don't think most Americans understand that their tax dollars went <laughs> to defeat you in Hungary. He's a brave man telling the truth all alone. From day one, he predicted what would be, uh, happen. That would never win up with Russia. And that the USA and NATO countries would bleed with armaments. I mean, would support them to to kingdom come. Ireland, once serene, is now grappling with the transformative impact of immigration, adding to its woes. But actually, the man was an immigrant. He was from Algeria. And as it turns out, he's been living in Ireland for 23 years at public expense. He has never had a job. And then last week, unaccountably, he's children. Well, many people in Ireland are absolutely sick of this. It's happening by design. That country has been completely transformed by immigration. It's not the Ireland you remember at all. The arrest of Gonzalo Lira, a vocal critic of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, underscores rising concerns about free speech. Or at least tacit approval of Gonzalo's arrest, since nothing else convincingly explains the conspicuous lack of response. Let me just read further, if I may, Tucker. I hope you will. Gonzalo was arrested last year on April the 15th, Good Friday, till the next Friday, 22nd, for that full week, without any charges. He was simply detained. They stole all of his equipment. He couldn't continue working after he was released for at least two, three weeks, trying to obtain equipment to continue. His criticism of Zelensky regime, supported by the US government, by Mr. Biden, who makes, you know, he is making gargles, you know, that we have to defend democracy. What democracy? He has never had democracy, let alone today with this man, Zelensky. He's a well-known dictator. They were going to have elections, Stucker, and they canceled those elections. During the Vietnam, there were elections in South Vietnam, in the middle of the Tucker, if you remember. I do remember, I lived those years in the USA. Let me say more. Last April 27th of this year, Gonzalo put on a web video this time, and for the first time, Tucker, heavily criticizing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Four days later, the Zelensky police detains Gonzalo through that terrible, sinister Gestapo called SPU. Ireland's descent into chaos echoes a sentiment that the political establishment has forsaken its citizens. So. It seems like Ireland's, a, of course, a small country, an island uh, in Western Europe, but it seems like this is kind of a, a, almost a metaphor for what's happening across the West. What do you make of the rioting there and the government's response to it? Well, look, you've been to Hungary. You know, Viktor Orban has led this fight for years and um, has tried to get his country, the sovereignty of it, to stay away from what's happening in Germany and places like Ireland. Ireland's probably one of the worst, if not the worst, because the political class has totally sold out the people. You know, they've had, I think, 125,000 immigrants in the last year. That That is the same equivalent if all of Joe Biden's 9 million illegal alien invaders here in our country all came within one year. That's, that's, what, that's the impact it's had on Ireland. And they're all on the public dole. There's been 100,000 in what, the 18 months or 20 months since the 100,000 all on the public dole, all paid for uh, out of the Irish budget. Now, some of that money is given by the EU, but the Irish politicians are by far the worst that are bought off uh, by the EU. They're the biggest globalists. They've sold out the sovereignty of, of the Irish. And you're seeing a natural blowback, and you're really seeing it among working class people in the cities, Irish nationals, Irish citizens, whose family have been there for generations and generations and generations and have nothing to show for it, and also in the rural communities. So Ireland is a powder keg. And I think what you saw the other day 
And the response by the Garda, the response by the authorities was immediately to go after Conor McGregor and other folks who were saying, hey, we need to address this. We need to, your 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 proclamations are no longer good enough. Joe Biden's administration, it seems, harbors a disfavor towards Hungary, raising geopolitical tensions. They describe you in the United States in the media as a fascist. And the Biden administration seems to believe it, the State Department anyway. They is, you know, the U.S. is the biggest most powerful country in the world. Are you worried about being crushed by the United States? It's dangerous, may I say. So we should not neglect the importance of that fact. When the United States administration does not like you or consider you as, uh, as an enemy or, 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 or having a, 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 a backtrack, it's, it's dangerous in international politics, you know. So. You, you are powerful, still number one power of the world. So if you criticize somebody, we have to be very cautious how to deal with that. And now the democratic administration does it regularly. So we have to be clear here that this is not the voice of America. It's the voice of the administration of United States. Not all Americans has the same approach as the government, like uh, the Republicans, who are far closer on value basis to us. Uh, the previous president is friend of Hungary on the value basis, historically and you know, uh, wholeheartedly. So it's a real friend. So don't make uh, a mistake to consider United States equal to the United States administration. Yes. And, and I think that, that difference is important because you have competition, a political system based on competition, and hopefully Trump will come back or Republicans will come back, and the relationship will be again very good. But now it's absurd. Can you imagine, can you imagine that United States government deleted the agreement between Hungary and the uh, United States on double taxation, but they still have the, the agreement between Russia and the United States? Hungary, hailed as a model for preserving dignity amidst adversity stands as a beacon in an uncertain world. I come here and I, re I notice, first thing, how moderate your politics are. Like, no one seems on the verge of anybody else. Even the people who hate Orban don't seem like they want to kill him. They just don't like him or they want, you know, want somebody else, but they don't. It doesn't seem superheated and crazy. It doesn't seem revolutionary. It seems just the opposite of revolutionary, actually. And there's something wonderful about that. There's something wonderfully moderate about that. What Hungary is saying to the West, we want to be part of the West. Hungary is part of NATO. It's not doing anything crazy or revolutionary. It's just like, hey, maybe don't push your garbage on us so aggressively. We've got our own thing going on here. We're pretty happy with it. Maybe you just leave us alone a little bit. It, I just find that thrilling to watch. It, thrilling because it's rational. It's incremental. It's, I hate revolutions because they never improve anyone's life. And Hungary, again, is a model for how you can preserve your dignity. You can have a pro-human society without anybody, without screaming, and without up what you already have. It's awesome. Tucker Carlson delves into the disconcerting state of Europe, shedding light on a complex and evolving situation. The United States is in a place right now where this is not sustainable. You can't run a global empire based on the imposition of boutique politics on countries that don't want them. The United States, I think, did a lot to liberate Hungary from the Soviets, from the Russians. And I'm proud of that. My father was involved in it. That's how I knew about Hungary, because my father visited Budapest 35 years ago when you were still under the yoke of the Soviets. And the purpose of American diplomacy in Eastern and Central Europe then was to help liberate the country so they could run themselves. And the idea was you didn't want a foreign superpower telling you how to live, because that's the opposite of democracy, it's tyranny. And to wake up one morning 35 years later and see my own government engaged in a, exactly the same kind of tyranny. The Soviets told you you had to worship Lenin. The State Department tells you now you have to worship transvestites. It's not so different. It's a foreign power pushing its weird boutique religion on you, and it's wrong. You worship whatever you want, it's your country. And I, I just believe as a practical matter, this can't continue because that's not the basis for a successful empire. Everybody wants freedom. Everyone understands the concept of self-determination. 
If you go to people who are under a foreign yoke and you say, someday you can be free. They understand that, they want that. That's a product you can sell because everybody wants it. You show up in a country and you say, you know what, your boys really should be girls. You know, there's some percentage who will be excited by the prospect of never having grandchildren. But most people won't be excited by that. In fact, most people will say, but boys can't become girls. It's biologically impossible. It can be determined at the chromosomal level. We can dig up bones 300,000 years old and tell whether they were male or female. There's no non-binary in science. You're insane. Go away. I mean, Gorbachev with uh, uh, Bush Sr., with President George Bush Sr., Gorbachev proposed him. We are going to dissolve the Soviet Union as such, and with it, we'll dissolve the Warsaw Pact, which was our response to NATO. But give me assurance that the countries that today belong to the Soviet Union and will be independent countries will not go into NATO. Putin, the only thing was asking Tucker was not to have a, enter the NATO alliance. He didn't want to be surrounded by NATO countries, just like John Kennedy didn't want the USA to have for crying out loud in Cuba. But he was doing the same. The big question is what if he had complied of not going into NATO force, you know, alliance. So the Irish government is trying to replace the population of Ireland with people from the third world, obviously. But why? What's the justification for that? Ireland was never a colonial power. These are not people they once ruled coming back to the mother country. Um, the same people have lived in Ireland for thousands of years. They have a native population and they're being replaced. Why would someone want to do that, you think? I think you're seeing it. I think you're seeing this because of the political class is very tied to Brussels. The political class, and there's really no true opposition party when you think from a populist nationalist perspective. They've got a couple of uh, small parties that are starting to grow. Of course, you got Sinn Fein, who's uh, the political arm, or the IRA, who are more and more taking on a nationalistic uh, bent. You've got a couple of small parties, one's kind of Trump inspired, uh, to combat this. But I think these people are seeing, you know, and look, you talk about the great replacement theory and people all, oh, you know, people get very upset when you talk about it, but you just look at the math. This Not has happened theory. across Europe. It's happened in Germany. This is why Orban has been so singled out. Um, this is why, quite frankly, Georgia Maloney, who, you know, was one the person who we supported a lot when she got in there because the EU was going to cut Italy off for money, really backed off a lot on this immigration policy. The Germans and uh, the people in Brussels, the party of Davos, just doesn't think the working class um, European population is very controllable. They think they're dangerous. They think they're the cause of these world and world one and world two. So they've always been, uh, they've tried to control them every way possible. Now they're using immigration. And Ireland is one of the worst examples. And that's why it's a powder. These country. men have been instructed to violate in letter and in spirit, federal law, and to hide the truth about UFOs from the American public. It is infuriating to watch this. But if you think about it for a second, it's also baffling. Why is this happening? Federal agencies have been lying about UFOs for more than 80 years. This has been a coordinated effort. It is both highly time consuming and very expensive. This was different because I started to uncover, you know, some very disturbing facts. Whatever they are, they are not of human origin, nor do they, nor do they behave according to the laws of known physics. And yes, the U.S. government currently has physical evidence that they exist. That means wreckage of the craft as well as the of the beings that flew them. Amazingly, all of this is true. Tucker Carlson explores the enigma of UFOs, emphasizing their non-human origin and defiance of known physics. Human beings have recorded seeing strange moving lights in the sky since, well, the beginning of known history record goes back thousands of years. What is that? We don't know. In the United States, people have been talking a lot about these strange lights, UFOs, since the Second World War. 
of military pilots recorded seeing things they called Foo Fighters out their cockpit windows. They had no idea what they were. Asserting the reality of UFOs and potential extraterrestrial life, Carlson unveils a series of ominous indications of government contact with these unidentified objects. In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. But in our country, it doesn't. The whistleblower's account ran on a technology website called The Debrief, which you've probably never heard of. The Washington Post had that story, but decided not to run it. We know that from the detailed testimony, much of it under oath, from several high-level whistleblowers, including longtime Intel officers Lou Elizondo and Dave Grush, both of whom we've talked to. But there have been many, about 10 so far. So the question is, now that the UAP Disclosure Act has passed, when can the rest of us see the information that we paid for and in fact own? The public's growing distrust in the government's narrative is highlighted as Carlson questions the transparency of UFO disclosures. One such person who has come forward recently is a longtime military intelligence officer, an Air Force major called Dave Grush. He's made a number of very interesting claims in public, including at congressional hearings. For example, here he is telling the Congress that in fact the U.S. government has retrieved, or as he puts it, biologics from crashed UAPs. The Pentagon has spent decades studying these otherworldly remains in order to build more technologically advanced weapons systems. Okay. That's what the former Intel officer revealed, and it was clear he was telling the truth. Carlson claims a history of over 80 years of government deception regarding UFOs, suggesting a long-standing pattern of misinformation. Do we possess this technology or don't we? And if we do, where is it? And there have been, as noted earlier, a number of pretty ominous indications over the years from apparently informed people that the U.S. government has been in direct contact with these forces, whatever they are, people who created and flew these objects, whatever they are. But there has been direct dialogue um, between the U.S. government, maybe other governments, and these entities. Are you aware of that? Has anyone even asked that question? to say the President of the United States or someone else who could answer it. I'm aware of it and I've talked to people about it, but it's it's just another rabbit hole I go down. And I have to be real careful, Tucker, to be honest with you, because you would not believe the amount of research and things I've gotten poured on me from all over the world. People send me books and, and photographs and things. And of course, a lot of that is, I think it's, it's fake um, yes. because they're trying to get me to embarrass me further, I guess, in this issue, but I'm, I'm not biting on all of it. I don't usually put any of it out, actually, just because, you know, I don't know if any of it's, if it's truthful or if it's, it's a government entity putting this garbage out to, um, to uh, discredit, you know, th this community or what have you, but it's a, it's a complete, um, it's, it's just, it's, it shows the, the mistrust the public has of our government and, and for good reason. Probing the motive behind government lies, Carlson prompts viewers to question the secrecy surrounding UFO encounters. What an interesting way to find out. Yeah, so You're reading the assessment yeah. of countries that are spying on us, and we've spied on their assessments of us. Yes, and and uh, I had a chain of custody on how we got that information. And, you know, I thought maybe, oh, this is passage material. we got to be very careful, which passage material would be like a form of disinformation. Do you try to trick a case officer to develop a, you know, relationship with yes. said asset? So I was like, well, wait a minute. Is this true? It, a certain adversary in ours thinks apparently this is true. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, I did talk to extremely, extremely, uh, and, you know, senior officials, both former directors of certain agencies. I, I had the privilege of having a relationship with them and I talked to them about this issue and they confirmed those details. And what was really interesting in the previous UFO programs records, so the OSAP program, which ran roughly 2008 to 2010 or so, and that was in the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, and this is this has been released by FOIA. You can actually go to DIA's website and and read this, but uh, the the paperwork included this very odd request from Senator Harry Reid. 
He sent a letter to the Deputy Secretary of Defense asking for something called a Provisional Special Access Program, or PSAP. I've never seen in my career a member of Congress ask the Department of Defense to develop a very classified program. And usually it's the reverse, right? Congress wants more transparency and of declassification. I'm like, this is very odd. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Why is Harry Reid saying that the OSAP program found something they needed to develop this uh, provisional special access program that is waived and bigoted, which is the most serious of SAPs. Waived means it's limited congressionally reported. That's uh, 10 U.S. Code Section 119. And bigoted meaning it's like by name. Mentioning clandestine sources, Carlson hints at foreign intelligence on the U.S. UFO program, adding layers to the narrative. Many Americans have been hurt in the process. But why? What's the point of this? Wouldn't it be a lot easier just to release the facts? Now, the conventional explanation for why they haven't been released is that the U.S. government is lying about UFOs because the truth about UFOs is too scary to reveal, that they're real, and our leaders wouldn't want to panic the population. But that's not true. In fact, it's ridiculous. Wouldn't want to terrify the population? Terrifying the population is what our government does best and most avidly. Officials regularly gin up irrational fears about white supremacy or Vladimir Putin or a dozen other topics as part of a pretty obvious control strategy. It's not like these people mind it scaring you. They want to scare you and they do it every day. So why would they lie about UFOs? Well, because they're covering up a obviously, and it's there. Someday we'll discover what that is. But in the meantime, here are a few questions that honest lawmakers ought to be asking. Have government agencies used tax dollars to procure advanced non-human technology? If they have, where exactly is that technology now? Has it been used for profit? How exactly has the American public benefited from that technology? And then this question, the most pressing of all, has the U.S. government communicated directly with the beings that piloted these craft? Have American officials ever entered into any sort of agreement with them? And if so, what are the terms of that agreement? These are not random questions. They are informed questions. And at this point, Americans have a moral right to know the answers. Carlson implies the government's extensive knowledge of UFOs, challenging the secrecy surrounding their nature. I had people come to me. I had access to the classified um, archives from those previous UFO programs that Lou Elizondo and others ran years prior. And, uh, you know, I saw I read some you know, extremely interesting foreign intelligence that was, was derived by, you know, clandestine human sources overseas espousing. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, something they're uh, noting about the U.S. They're like, yeah, the U.S. has a retrieval program, reverse engineering program. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This was the assessment of other countries. Other countries, yeah. And I, and I'm, by the way, I ran all this through DOD security and pre-publication review, mind you. So anything I say in detail, I'm, I'm, I'm a steward of security. I care about national security and I would never want to say something publicly uh, that would, you know, hamper national security. Just to put that out there. Lou Elizondo, a figure in the Pentagon running a UFO program, becomes a focal point as Carlson delves into the government's involvement. One of the great secrets of Washington, known to everyone inside Washington, is that many of the most powerful members of Congress do not work for their constituents, much less for the rest of us, for the country at large. They are instead puppets of the most secretive federal agencies. They are controlled effectively by the permanent bureaucracy, including through bribery and blackmail. Two such members happen to be especially powerful this term. They are Congressman Mike Rogers of Alabama, who is the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio, who is chairman of the House Intel Committee. They're working to do that right now. Carlson questions the irony of demanding truth after years of government lies and funding of secretive UFO programs. So you spent over 14 years in this world. Yes. And then suddenly the rest of us encounter you in public mm -hmm. saying that the U.S. government has a very detailed knowledge of what these things are and has for a long time. Yeah, I had no personal interest in the UFO subject, really. You know, certainly I you know grew up and I saw stuff on the History Channel, that kind of thing. But having studied physics, became an intel officer, I was very agnostic about the subject. And 
I was in a position of extreme trust. You know, I handled the presidential daily brief for my agency's director at the National Reconnaissance Office when I was an Air Force Reserve officer. It was widely cleared uh, to most black programs in the Department of Defense. What's a black program? Uh, you know, special access programs, uh -huh. right? And um, I figured kind of uh, uh, that I would know if, if that kind of program exists. It was kind of a joke between, you know, myself and other colleagues over the years, like, haha, when are we gonna get read into, you know, the UFO stuff? And we yeah. thought that it was a total joke, but it wasn't until, um, you know, I saw the New York Times article in, in 2017 and, and I- What was that article? So that was a, a story about uh, Lou Elizondo and other individuals that ran the um, the ATIP program and the OSAP program. So advanced aerospace weapons systems applications. And to be clear, I think the government has never admitted that he was or denied, in fact, that Elizondo was involved yeah. in that. Story. No, he, he certainly was. I remember um, in a very senior official's office in McLean, uh, briefing that senior official into about a couple hundred special access programs, because at the time I was a trusted individual um, advising the Joint Chiefs on certain black programs. And I remember that individual who was a coworker of, you know, Lou Elizondo uh, mentioned, oh, there's this guy named Lou Elizondo over at the Pentagon. He's running some UFO program. We think he lost his mind. Uh, he's giving the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence a hard time. And this was six months prior to that Leslie Clean and Ralph Blumenthal article in yeah. December, 2017. Viewers are left with a sense of intrigue and skepticism, compelled to reevaluate the narrative surrounding government disclosure of UFOs. The, the stakes in this particular story seem pretty high since the government has evidence that we're not alone in the universe, that there is some form of intelligent life or something that is creating these crafts. They're buzzing the earth. We don't know if they're from outer space, if they're spiritual beings. I mean, we, we just don't know the answer, but the government does know, but they're lying about it, because why? And so do, does it occur that maybe the, the billions of unaccounted Pentagon funds that you mentioned that turn up in every uh, accounting process, that maybe that they're not lost through incompetence. Maybe those are attached to programs that we're not allowed to know about. I completely think it's intentional, Tucker. You're exactly right, as usual. Um, you know, they've been lying about it since 1947. And then all of a sudden, we're going to pass legislation and they're going to say, oh, well, we're going to come out and tell you the truth. I mean, this. You know, Schumer's thing, everybody's on me because I'm not really sure about the, the Schumer Amendment because it, it, it basically is modeled after the, uh, the Kennedy um, right. files and, the, and here we are 60 years later and we haven't done that. I, I guess it's a good step forward, but the reality is we're gonna tell them to tell us the truth after they've been lying to us and they've been funding these programs. Lou Elizondo, for instance, he's the program that he was involved with for, for the longest period of time, they said it didn't exist. Yet he shows up and he's got a department that works for him. And so, you know, this thing has just been going on, like I said, at least since 1947. And we know it's been going on maybe before then at some point. It's it's a worldwide phenomena. We have we have some of the best pilots, not not in East Tennessee, the best pilots in the world that are telling me their crafts have been buzzed by this.